Good morning. We are starting a little late, uh, but we'll just dive right in and get going. It's fantastic to be here at uh, Beyond Teleron and in Berlin. Like Mark said, we just got in from Amsterdam, had a good week there last week. So we'll do a little talking about design and performance. Who's design, who's performance? Yeah, who's who? So my background is design. Uh, I was lucky enough to graduate uh, from design school 20 years ago. Makes me old. Uh, but I was lucky enough to go straight into web design. So I actually designed my first website in Mosaic, of all things. Um, so I've had a lot of fun doing that over the years. And you know, why are we up here, Steve? What are we doing? Well, I've been working on performance, not 20 years, maybe 12 years. Uh, but I've done a lot of work in performance and something I noticed about two years ago is that we didn't have a lot of designers at the Velocity Conference that I run. And I'm proud to say at uh, Velocity New York uh, earlier this month and Amsterdam last month, we now have a design track. And I think that that's really important and, and that's what we want to talk about today is trying to bring developers, especially developers focused on performance and designers closer together. Kind of like that. <laughs> this is how we are, right? <laughs> Everyone can be like this. Well, and, and so it's been really interesting, right, over the last two or three years of working with Steve to actually bring these two practice areas together. Um, and, you know, I'm from New Zealand. In New Zealand, we're a little bit smaller, so we tend to not be quite so specialised. So over my 20 years, I've done as much code as I have design. And so it's been really interesting to collaborate over the last two or three years. And part of what we're going to present today is some of the learnings and the techniques and the knowledge uh, that we've discovered by sharing. And while it's true that Mark and I uh, get along really well and snuggle quite a bit, um, <laughs> I've been at some companies where bringing designers and developers together doesn't always go so smoothly. It's a lot like this without the pillows, where both sides feel like it's a battle, like they're opposing forces. And if one side gives in, the other side wins. Are we going to compromise and have less content for speed than design loses? If design insists on those drop shadows, then performance loses. And it really doesn't have to be that way. Right? We can have both. That's right. And so what we believe is it's a little bit more like this, right? It's a little bit more yin and yang. Um, we've seen this um, growing in other conferences. So DevOps, probably most of you have heard of, has been a great, great collaboration between developers and kind of ops. We would kind of argue that that sort of communication and that style of working needs to expand even further, right? So right into design, uh, right into kind of marketing and the full kind of content pipeline. And some of the examples we'll show you today is the sort of results that you can get if you apply that methodology. We didn't have uh, Jesenia in Amsterdam last week, but she was in New York. Uh, she's a career designer. She actually spoke in Santa Clara of Velocity uh, back in May. And she's actually one of the first designers I heard talking about her perspective from the design perspective, her per perspective on performance. And, and she, in this talk, of course, she's you know, very up on performance now, but she admits that at the beginning, she used to be a reckless designer, right? She would do fantastic work, aesthetically pleasing, very rich, but not always focused on performance. Did she set out with the goal of building a page that took two minutes and 43, 46 seconds to load? Probably not. Hopefully no one in this room is measuring load times in minutes. <laughs> Unless you're on the hotel Wi-Fi. 512K. Um, that wasn't her goal when she set out. And certainly if you've gone to my talks or read my blogs or uh, looked at any of my decks, we have the, a plethora of these case studies that show that performance and happy users, performance and positive user metrics, performance and positive business metrics are highly correlated. And so we're going to skip over those and dig into some of this new stuff. But I think before we start, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. We agree? Fast is good? Yeah? OK. So let's do a quick recount of where we are. So we know that 
In some organizations, designers and developers work in silos. Yeah, and we also know that uh, some designs are hard to make fast. So if you're oblivious to the performance optimizations needed and you're stuck in Photoshop and you just chuck all those pixels in, we know that that can be tough to optimize after the fact. And yet, what those case studies tell us is fast is good. So we have a quandary. And we need to resolve that. We need to be happy and snuggle. Any tips from your experience on how to do that? Yeah, so um, in my previous role, uh, I was actually a creative director uh, managing a team of 50 odd people delivering you know, large websites. And we had real challenges with performance. And so one of the ways that we tackled this was to apply more of that classic lean methodology, the agile methodologies that we've heard so much about in the last five years, but actually put that into practice the whole way through the content pipeline. And one of those key things to do is to have really small interdisciplinary teams. And I'm talking tiny here, so one designer, one front-end person, one back-end person, a UX researcher, the product owner, you know, like a small team that can actually very quickly iterate uh, and move through these cycles to actually get a prototype up and running. Coming from big companies like Google and Yahoo, that usually was not the case. We would have people in different groups depending on their skill set. But sometimes, especially with new kind of innovative pro projects, we would kick off a team like this and it really worked a lot better. That's right. And, and some of the things that we did, which you know, some of you will like, some of you won't, is we did things like ban Photoshop. So we banned people from being stuck in their silos, working in very traditional uh, methods. So putting all that together into a prototype right from the outset. Uh, and working in the native environment of the web. Now, one of the other things that we did that was really important is establish guiding principles for the project. So this was even before a traditional creative brief where we would bring the entire team together and it was really important to have the whole team. So developers, uh, designers, the client, uh, the entire organization that's gonna be involved in this project and we would sit down and we would talk about what's important. And the trick that you can use here is to talk about user experience. And whatever you think of UX as a term, the one benefit that it really has is that no one's going to argue against a good user experience. So you can say to everyone, what are we trying to achieve here? What are our goals? And so you can create these guiding principles that then get rid of those arguments down the track. You never have that confrontation, which I don't know if you've had this, Steve, where um, it's unspoken and it's implicit that it should be fast, but then yet the design team will run off and they'll chuck all those pixels in, make something beautiful, that'll get signed off, it gets thrown over the wall, and then what happens? Yeah, it ends up being slow. You're trying to slap on performance at the end. Yeah. I really appreciate this in some of those um, bigger projects where we didn't have this team at the beginning and we didn't collaborati co collaboratively set those principles. You're kind of, as a development, you're kind of brought in after that work has been done, talking to users, day in the life studies, design studies, see how we're going to construct the pro product and what the motivations are behind it. If you're brought in after the fact, you don't have that history, that appreciation that is going to be important as you build out and do the implementation. That's right. Uh, and so I've got a couple of examples here of what those principles might look like. So this first ex example is from a news website, uh, and it's news, right? So we're standing on the side of the street, we've got 10 seconds while we're waiting for the bus, we just want to grab those headlines as quickly as possible. So these sorts of uh, principles are embodied in here, you know, this idea of speed, and that both speed is more important than necessarily it being really rich and, and designed uh, and embellished. And we've even gone as far as having an explicit measure in here in, in terms of how fast that user experience should be. In contrast to that, here's a different principle, which is a tourism website, which we'll see uh, shortly in a case study, where we're trying to convince people to come to New Zealand. So it has to be really rich, it has to be really engaging, and potentially people are making a big decision about flying all the way around the world to our beautiful country, we've potentially got more time uh, to engage them. And so 
this principle really expresses the fact that it needs to be really rich, uh, but we need to engage them right from the, the outset. And it doesn't have, you know, I like, I, you know, as a, the performance person, I really like that previous one where the performance goal was set out at very explicitly, even, you know, uh, quantified. This one still talks about performance, but not, it doesn't quantify it, but it's talking about streaming that rich content and making it unobtrusive, making, making, not making the user realize that there's a lot of content that they're waiting for, just having it there. Um, and the third really critical technique is to prototype early. Uh, and when I say early, I really mean early. So this is why the designers were not in Photoshop. They were still working on grids and they were working on layouts and they were creating uh, you know, graphics and elements, but those were going straight into uh, a prototype that the front-end developer was putting together. And this is a real shot from a meeting, and I love this moment because you've got the front-end developer here in the front, he's manipulating like the grids and the layouts and the prototype which is on the TV screen, that's the designer there in the middle, and you've got the client. And so we're all revolved around this prototype in the medium that it's going to be delivered in from the outset, not these fake kind of mock-ups you know, on the wall. And it means that you can measure that right from the outset as well. And you can't necessarily change everything on the fly, but I don't know how many people go into Chrome DevTools or whatever uh, inspector you use and change CSS on the fly to try to get different looks and feels. It's really easy to do and you can do it in real time. And so there is a lot to be gained having all of the uh, participants there together and working on the prototype, seeing what changes look like. That's right, and people love it. Like you say to a front-end developer, this is a throwaway prototype, it's not production code. What are the latest and greatest things that you want to try out? Build it in Node, build it in Angular, I don't care. As long as you can iterate really fast and express the concept and put it together. So this is, this is a lot of fun. Uh, and sort of the point here in these examples is to really kind of iterate quickly uh, and move through a cycle uh, quite often in a week. So in a week, we would spend the first day conceptualizing, uh, laying things out, uh, then we would build a prototype, and then on Wednesday, we would be putting that in front of actual users, uh, and a UX researcher would be testing that prototype and collecting feedback so that we could iterate on a weekly cycle, not on the final product, but on the biggest questions. So I think far too often people start with, okay, we're going to do the home page, then we're going to do the template, we're going to do this, and da, da, da. Whereas what we were iterating through were what are the biggest stumbling blocks in a project. So for the news project, it was the content. What's going to change in the newsroom to give us richer content? And how would we prototype that editorial process? So we have some you know, kind of abstract techniques or best practices here small teams, interdisciplinary, prototyping early, guiding principles, but you have a great example from your work where you put these in place and ended up with a great result. Let's take a look at that. So I want to present a short case study here which uh, was for Tourism New Zealand and this was an amazing project. I feel really privileged to be involved in this project. Uh, it was really unique in that Tourism New Zealand would normally spend huge amounts of money on a big brand TV commercial, right? So high production values. And their brief was literally, this year we're not going to do that. We're going to give you all that budget and we want you to put that into the web. And we want you to build the most immersive experience uh, that you can. And so we had a simple idea. Our simple idea was to try and put people virtually in New Zealand. And at the time, like the parallax stuff was kind of cool, and we were like, what if we did that for real? So we literally went out and built these huge scaffold towers in some of the most amazing places in New Zealand. And then we attached a motion control camera to it and took a time-lapse sequence over time, creating all this amazing, rich imagery. And then we had to figure out how we get that into the browser. So I don't know what other people think. I see this, especially these beautiful scenes, and I think slow. I think this is going to be <laughs> beautiful. It's going to be rich. But how are you going to deliver that in a way? Because remember, one of the guiding principles here was unobtrusively stream this content. Yeah. How are you going to do that? Right? 
So how did you do it? Well, so before we did that, this, this is the end result, right? So we took all that rich content, we put it in the browser, and we created this really delightful experience where without having to tell anyone what was going on, you just interacted with the page. And it became really delightful because you're now in control of that camera. You are literally scrolling through these amazing scenes in New Zealand, and there's a bit of content over the top. I don't think I'm ever going to get a chance to do a project like this again. Like, it was just phenomenal. Um, so let's, let's peel back the, okay, okay. the front. How do we make Look it fast? Underneath. How do we make it fast? So here's an example of what the same experience looks like over an incredibly slow connection. So this is pretty much From my speed. hotel, we recorded this. E even slower. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we settled on here after doing dozens of prototypes uh, was the idea of using a sprite sheet. So we had all the frames, but we delivered those in a sprite sheet, and then we chopped that out using Canvas, and we put it in the browser. And you can see it's really blurry to start with, but that blurriness is familiar, right? Like, we've all seen progressive JPEGs, so we're quite familiar with that idea of looking at content that is a little bit blurry, and then it gets sharper over time. And what you can see on the, the top left here is like our visual debugging tool where we've got the three levels of sprite sheets uh, and then we've got a frames, all the high res frames over the top. And when the playback pa head pauses, then we start walking out this experience in both directions. So this homepage was actually nearly 25 megabytes, but the initial experience streamed in within 100K. So, you know, of course, the, the low resolution Im imagery is not as rich as the you know uh, high res, but if I'm on a slow connection, I'm happy seeing that rather than nothing. If I had to wait for 23 meg to get downloaded before I could see something on the page or before I could scroll, that would be really painful. So I like this idea of bringing in that content gradually. Yeah, and this only came out of that collaboration. So the fact that the developers were there at the outset of the project, and they literally went pale when I said there must be no loading bars. You know, we had to come up with this technique. And so here's a quick example of what that first sprite sheet looks like. And it's only, only 34K. And you can immediately interact with the page. That's uh, small, that's tiny. Here's the next kind of level. And you can see they're just getting larger and more kind of high res. And then finally we have, you know, the 200 high quality frames over the top, uh, putting it all together. So one of the key takeaways from this project for me and, and doing a lot of prototyping around these sorts of processes is that I still feel like, uh, and I blame myself here as a designer as well, is that too often we still talk about pages. And we have this mental model of publishing static pages, which comes from a rich uh, you know, history of graphic design. But in fact, my belief is that the web is a time-based medium. And so the more you think about it as a time-based medium, the more you think about each millisecond and craft that experience of how the content flows in and out, the more, you know, the faster you can create a, a, an experience like this and balance that desire for richness, but speed as well. And this is one of the key takeaways from the, our talk today. And I think it's kind of a big concept especially as websites are getting bigger and bigger, richer and richer, is you don't, it's not like the old days where someone clicks on a link and you deliver all of the content in the next step. It's a longer timeline than that. And this content, like I just said a minute ago, this content is gradually coming in over time. So we need to think about that other dimension, adding that dimension of time. It's not just about what you see on the screen. Yeah, so it's really this idea of content flow. And, and really thinking from a user experience point of view and how we flow that content in and out of the browser. And it's much more like designing a movie and we should use the language of film and storyboards and those sorts of techniques to actually show what our designs look like as they flow in and out of the browser. So we need techniques like that to do the design, but if this is the type of websites that we're gonna be building going forward, we also need better techniques to measure performance as well. Um, and so, of course, that's something I really care a lot about. And I need to, uh, we needed to figure out a way to try to help 
designers who are working on sites like this to capture some idea of what the performance was going to be like, especially in this more complex situation where time was a new dimension that we had to take into consideration. Um, so I'm a huge fan of web page tests, and we forgot to mention at the beginning, we work at a new company now, Speedcurve, which is based on web page tests, a free open source tool. That might be one of the other most important takeaways from today, <laughs> webpagetest.org. And one of the things that web page test introduced, it's probably been five years now, is this concept of film strips, where you can really see this time dimension starting to play out. But what this does is it takes that time dimension and it really makes it more transparent to developers and designers of how that content in the current site is coming in in that gradual fashion. Are the most important things coming in first and how long is it taking for the content to come in? So you gain that appreciation. And if you ever need budget to do performance work, all you need to do is put film strips like this of your site and a few of your competitors in front of a CEO and they will just, you know, you don't have to say anything and that's the beautiful thing about these film strips is you look at them and you just go, why is there all that white space? Although, Mark, where, that, where, where's the tag manager and all the third party content? Like what is blocking, you know, loading this experience? Although, actually, that budget argument only works if you're, you know, one of these slow ones. If you're actually vitally doing, you know, and you're <laughs> faster than all the competitors, then just go to the pub and get a drink. <laughs> so, uh, this is a great innovation from web page test. We have this in Speed Curve, too. Um, another great thing from web page test is the side-by-side -side videos. So, really, it's not a video. We're taking those stills, those screenshots over time, and putting them together in a video. And you can take multiple results and it's really easy to put them side by side like this. And so the film strips can tell that story, can help you get more budget if you need it. Um, but these videos also evoke almost a more visceral reaction to how slow a website can feel. So I think these are really important. And we talked about we really need to focus more on design, on the mm -hmm. user experience, and things that show what is happening on the screen is a great way to do that. But there's also times where you need numbers. You need to track things with numbers and with charts. Um, and so this is a challenge now because we're in a new world and we need to figure out how to capture this sense of a user experience over time with numbers. Luckily, we've had some innovation in the last couple of years with the uh, W3C Web Performance Working Group working on these timing specs that are out in almost every new browser except Safari, unfortunately. There's the navigation timing spec, which is uh, times for the overall page. Resource timing, where you can get detailed timing information for every HTTP request in the page. And the user timing spec that gives you this ability to set high uh, resolution timer marks and measures throughout the page. Because again, this content is flowing in over time and so we need to measure that content as it flows in so that we know when the content that we care about, that we know users care about, is being rendered and we can optimize that if there's a performance problem. Now when we started working on this, uh, these specs back in 2010, um, really what our goal was, was to have a more accurate page load time, window.onload. There were some uh, limitations in browsers at the time that made that inaccurate. But what happened, it took us about three years to get these specs out, and d during that time, pages really got a lot more complex. Um, it's kind of you know, old terminology to say Web 1.0, Web 2.0, but that's really what happened. We got a lot of lazy loading, uh, proactive loading, asynchronous loading, blocking loading, and all of those things made window.onload not correlate with what users were seeing on the page. But isn't that the thing that most people are still measuring? Yeah, unfortunately, if you look, even web page tests, which I love, the very first metric they show you is onload time. And it really, it, onload is great if you're in that web 1.0 world where the user clicks a link and everything is on the screen instantaneously, but that's not the way most websites work today. And so onload isn't gonna tell you that story about the timeline, about how content is coming in over time. Um, and I've got two great examples that demonstrate that. Let's look at Gmail. 
Um, I don't know about you, but this is the screen that I dread seeing when I start up Gmail. That's why I leave it running all day. And if you look at the onload time, window.onload, uh, in this case it was 3.9 seconds, but that content is not the content that the user is waiting for, right? It's not until a second later that we actually get most of the pixels painted in the viewport telling me what's in my inbox. So in this case, if the team is using window.onload as their main performance metric, it's not telling them the whole story. It's, it's painting a, a story that's a little too rosy. Performance is worse than that. Now on the flip side, it's easy to find lots of examples. Amazon, I don't know about you, I think of their pages is kind of bloated. Huge amount of stuff, yeah. All that reviews and cross promotion and stuff. But if you look at it, the pixels in the viewport come in in two seconds. They've done a great job of optimizing the content that the user cares about above the folder in the viewport. And sure enough, it takes another eight seconds for all that other content to load, but it's below the fold, it's outside the viewport, so it's not affecting the user experience. And I think this is a great example of thinking about pages as more time-based of that content flow we're talking about, right? Because if you just dumped all the Amazon content on one page and loaded it, you're forcing people to wait for 10 seconds. So then they're going to abandon and go somewhere else. So this can have a huge impact over not only the user experience, but your business metrics as well and KPIs. Yeah. So in this case, window onload would be way too hypercritical. The team is doing a much better job than that. Um, so window.onload really isn't going to work. In fact, any performance metric that gives all the pixels in the screen the same level of importance is a bad performance metric. That's not telling the story of what the user is seeing and what the user is experiencing. That's right, because my ad pixels are the most important pixels, right? You know, uh, maybe it is where you work, but if so, hopefully you set that out as a guiding principle, right? And yeah. you did that intentionally. And if that is a guiding principle, and you know, let's face it, you know, websites need to make money, then at least get some metrics that are tracking when the ads are loading. And maybe for other people, it's not ads. You know, it's a, a product uh, photo or um, promotions. But whatever it is that is the guiding principle, the most important content on the page, you got to be able to measure that. And if you're just doing an onload, it might be you're loading the content asynchronously, and onload isn't telling anything about telling you anything about that. So I don't know, but is that surprising to say that the performance metrics that are out there today really aren't telling you something that's important about how users actually look at your website? I find that surprising. I don't know, but because we're all stuck with these line series charts, right? And you look at any monitoring tool, there's time series charts for Africa, like it's just, it's all in there. And it gives you this false sense of, well, surely this is giving me some meaningful information. But as we've just seen, like this line potentially doesn't correlate to anything. And I think that's a great way to phrase it, this false sense of security. Mm. You, you see these numbers, you see these charts, and you think that it's telling you the truth. And really, you know, you have to look at your page. It might be that it correlates to the content on your page but it's pretty likely that it does Well, and in fact, we've seen it go even worse, right? So we do performance audits of some of you know, the biggest publishers on the planet, and we've seen people take best practice rules, unfortunately some of Steve's rules, and apply them to a website, and it actually worsens the user experience, because the thing that they're monitoring was not the user experience. So it can actually send you totally down the right track, and you can waste time and budget and resource optimizing against the wrong metro. So, what we have to do, right, is we have to focus on the user experience. What we all want, designers and developers, we all want the same thing. We want to make enjoyable, engaging user experiences, and fast, too. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to use these easy metrics that people are giving us that really don't correlate to that user experience. All right, Steve, stop holding out on us. I know you've got some techniques for us. What we have to do is we have to do some heavy list lifting, and we have to create these custom metrics because we know what our website is doing, we know the content that the user thinks is most valuable, and so only we can, only the team 
can implement those metrics. Right. And so hopefully from the guiding principles, you know what the most important content on the page is, what has the highest priority. You can use that user timing spec that I mentioned previously to do these marks and measures. It's built into the browser. Safari and mobile Safari are very important, but it's a very easy spec to shim. Um, and the nice thing is you can track those metrics with both ROM, real user monitoring solutions, and synthetic solutions like web page tests and speed curve. Because it's a spec, that's the beauty of specs. So let's not be so abstract. I really like, again, like the tourism New Zealand example. Let's look at an example of custom metrics. This was one of the first ones I remember coming out. This was uh, 2012, 2013, an article that Twitter wrote where their number one performance metric that they tracked was time to first tweet. And what they mean by that is how long it takes for the tweet at the top of the timeline to render. And that makes sense, right? We load Twitter, where do our eyes focus? We're waiting for the timeline to load and we want to see what the most recent tweet is, the most recent news. I, I think this is such a huge technique that I think we should dwell on it at a moment because all the time we get asked what would, should we measure and kind of how and like what built-in metrics should we be optimizing our sites for. And so the point here is to basically ignore everything except the metric that you define and you define it based on your known user experience. And imagine having a metric like this across your organization. So not the performance engineers talking about all the gobbledygook, not the marketing talking about their business KPIs. This one nice metric, you know, a time to first tweet, or I know Pinterest has a time to first pin. You know, it's quite easy to sit down and go, what is the one metric that we care about as an organization that if we're moving forward, we want to move this one metric? So the value of that uh, as a technique for communicating across the organization is, is huge. So I actually think it's important. Mark invited me here to talk about the things that I do. I mostly write code. So yeah. I think it's important to show this in an example of this. I was worried it was going to be too early to actually show code, but I think that music really woke us all up this morning, didn't it? So, so hopefully we're ready for that. So let's think about if you wanted to build in JavaScript a metric to measure when this first tweet renders, how would you do that? Well, the thing to focus on is the image because the text is going to come down in the markup. The image is going to take an extra step. So what we need to do is we need to develop a custom metric, not for image download time, but for image display time. And it turns out there's nothing built in browsers to do this. And in fact, when I talked to some browser developers, they said it's not possible. What about just onload? Can I just use onload on an image? Right. So here's the snippet from Twitter for the first tweet. Eric Lawrence, definitely follow him. And it's got this IMG tag in it, right? So the first thing we might try is adding an onload. And in fact, this is what I tried. Now, the beauty was I could load this page. I had this test page. I took the Twitter, uh, HTML, and markup in JavaScript, created this test page, and I could load it in web page test, and I added this display where it would display the onload time in the page, and I would see what that said, and I would compare it to the actual film strips. And it turned out it was way too early. The onload time was way too fast. It fired before the image was visible. So onload's not onload. Well, it's onload for when the image downloads, but we're trying to measure when the image is rendered. And it turned out, like most pages, there was a style sheet in the page. And in this case, the style sheet was really big. It took a long time to download. And for people who don't know it, nothing in the page will render until all style sheets are downloaded. So even though the image and the text in the tweet were already downloaded and in the browser's memory, the screen was blank until the style sheet would finish. So we needed to have another way to measure that. And it turned out it was pretty simple. After some testing and looking in web page tests, I found that if you just put an inline script block right after the IMG tag and take a measurement there, then that will take into account these blocking resources like synchronous blocking scripts and style sheets that block rendering in the page. And so if you look here, we have two of them. And just to make it clear, this is the user timing spec. It's in the window.performance global variable, which all major browsers except Safari have. 
and there are just two functions, mark and measure, that are the primary functions to use. It's a very simple API, but as you can see from this example, the tricky part is figuring out where to put those measurements. So in this case, we have two measurements taken for image displayed, and really what we want is we want the greater of those two. So just a little hack, we can use this clear measures so that any previous measurements with that name are cleared out and only the uh, highest, the maximum measurement is retained. And so with this technique, we can actually measure in JavaScript when images get rendered to the screen. And so it lets us capture these custom metrics about delivering content in the flow of time as the user is engaging with the page. So this is my time to first tweet, my time to first pin. It's the metric that I really care about and I can, I can monitor and track that. And yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of teams might have just one critical element in the page, but most likely there's half a dozen or so. And you can put as many of these marks and measures. And again, like I said, the beautiful thing about it is this user timing spec, it's a spec, it's standardized, and so all of the frameworks, Google Analytics, Mpulse, Speed Curve, Web Page Test, most of them will pull this out automatically. You don't have to do any special integration with a metrics service in order to see these uh, charts about your custom metrics. So this is, I think, the second big takeaway of the talk is we need to get better metrics that are measuring what we care about, what users care about, and it's that flow of content on the page, and we're not gonna get that with this onload time that is at the end that may or may not correlate with your asynchronous or blocking loading of your content. We need to get these custom metrics to measure the most important content in the page. Yeah, and so to, to recap a little bit, what I love about that is that we're sort of, we're collapsing all these processes down, right? So rather than these big silos, we're trying to work in these small teams, and in some ways we're trying to have these really nimble measurements that can go straight into this prototyping process. So, so that mental model shift away from this is just my discipline to actually thinking about the whole content pipeline and how we measure it, I think is, is a really important shift. And then this time-based thinking, like this mental model shift away from static publishing to flowing the content in and out of the browser, I think is, is a really important uh, takeaway as well. It's a different way of thinking about how you're delivering that experience to users. Yeah, and, and I think this can literally be in your language. So I would challenge you after Beyond Hellaround to, you know, when you go back, to your teams and you're working with marketing and other people and they put that big huge mock-up on the wall and go, right, deliver it fast, that you should actually change your language to ask, you know, how is that experience going to play? You know, what happens first and then what? So use your language to shift the mental model away from the static uh, publishing uh, mode into thinking about timelines and sequences and flowing this content in and out of the browser. And if we're going to make that shift about how we talk about the design process and, the, and thinking about that user experience, we also need to think about different ways of measuring that yeah. content flow and the performance. Um, and so that's, I think, another key takeaway here. And unfortunately, right now, it's going to take a little bit of work building these custom metrics, but it's not that hard. And there are services out there that will pick up these custom metrics and let you see how your performance is for real users. So I think that's it. Yeah, have an awesome Beyond Tellerand. We're really happy to be here. And if you've got any questions, just come and grab us after. Look forward to talking to you. Thank you.